So in any case, she makes lots of small games exploring, exploring complicated uh, concepts. So the first point I want to make is that like, small games can be impactful. Like this video is stuck with me, and I was just so amazed at how this Python experience can make this huge personality, right? Multiply millions of views, million, I don't know, probably a lot of subscribers. But like, like this guy playing it and just showing the world the kind of impact that small, tiny games can have. So that's the first one. Now, like the next point, when we started at studios, we did this exercise that we like to call six games in six weeks. Um, when we first started, we had the four of us, but we were all programmers. So we kind of split the work between us, and we actually we eventually made um, seven games in six weeks actually. Now, granted, these games are really small. Like most of them, you can probably play like one to five minutes, uh, right? So obviously, we didn't make much money from it. But something that was really valuable from this experience, this six weeks, was practice. So not only did we make a game, but we also went through the whole gauntlet from the beginning of ideation to the end of releasing the game. Most of these games you see here right now are out on the App Store and Android Play Store um, for oh, a price tag. But anyway, they're out, and the point is we got a lot of practice releasing games, right? So that the process of releasing the game didn't become this like arduous, long thing that we kind of didn't want to do. It just became second nature because we just did it so much, did it so often. So many games we do really good practice. Now the last point is that just as the beginning of this year, um, Rami Ismail, who's kind of like a community leader in the game industry like around the world, he launched this app called the Meditation. Um, it's just called Meditations. <laughs> and what's amazing about this is that Meditations is a launcher. So it just opens up software for you that delivers a new game for you every single day. So you turn on meditations, you launch the game, you play it, and 24 hours later when you want to open it again, it's going to give you a different game. So the whole point is you have a different game to play every single day. And it's really, these games are actually really interesting because what Rami did was he and a small team organized developers all around the world. We have more than 350 of them to each make a game for each of the day of the year. Um, so these small games that these developers made, they they related to the day itself in some way, in some personal way, right? So for example, maybe Jan the first, um, they'll be a developer out there with some with some personal meaning that, that they has for them, and they'll make a game around that. So now you have these little games, these little packages of really personal experiences that you can play and. People on Twitter have been talking about how they related to these experiences, um, and you're gonna have a new one every single day, right? So, tiny games, that's still a lot of innovation to be done in this idea of small games with possibly impactful outcomes. Um, and it's still being done this year, right now, today. Okay, now, second why, um, you don't only have to make small games. We did make the team which was five months. It's relatively short, but it's not as short as two weeks. But what we did do was broke up the five months into two week intervals, right? So we still had the same mindset going into it as we would with making a small game in two weeks. It's just that we broke down the bigger project into smaller development cycles. So why short development cycles? Uh, first of all, let's review what we want to do. So typically with a short development cycle, you would set a goal at the beginning, right? What do you want to achieve that week or that cycle? And at the end of it, you come back, either reflect with yourself or with your team, and you ask yourself, uh, did we achieve the goal we set for ourselves in the beginning of the cycle? Right? So reviewing, it just helps you make sure that you're on the right track, you are doing the thing you plan to do, and you don't like sidetrack and end up implementing 50 other features that you didn't really want to, but got distracted by, and then now you're confused, like, where am I, what was I trying to do in the first place? Right? Let's review the work that you've done. And also, it's really just a nice time to appreciate the work that you've done, right? Often you can get stuck in the rabbit hole and forget about the amazing things you do and just not, just start to, like, hate what you're doing. When every week developers are making amazing things, and I really do think people need to, or developers need slow down a little bit and appreciate what you're doing a bit more. You can be very critical of yourself, right? Um, although sometimes if you're like this, you end up not quite making what you want to make, and then you have like expressions like these, 
Um, I should mention um, they, this spot uh, 25 are very talented to other city. So I just want to put as many as I can there. Um, and also, um, I, I will talk about a number of videos and games throughout this talk. So I will have a link to all the resources. So don't worry about it. Um, you can just copy the link to the end with all the games and articles I mentioned in this talk. Now, the second point um, learning. Obviously, something that very naturally comes from reviewing your product or your game is some lessons, some learning from track. But another point I really want to drive through here is that there's a learning to be had if you step away from the game as well, right? So this is, with short development cycles, you can give yourself the time to step away and ask yourself about how you are working as a person, if you're working individually, or if you're working in a team, how are you working with your teammates, right? It's not about the game anymore, it's not about how you can improve the game, but rather how can you improve yourself, or how can you improve your relationship with your team to work better, right? So there's learning to be had here that can be very easily like, overlooked if you don't make time for it. And finally, pivoting. So I'm going to tell a personal story first. Um, I have a very intimate relationship with um, something known as the sunken cost fallacy. And if you guys haven't heard of it before, the, the crux of it is um, when you invest something into a game, or any game, uh, so let's say I invest five months of my time into a game, I'm going to feel like, man, I've already worked on this for five months. I'm going to work on this a little bit more, make it a perfect thing, and then I'll release it, right? I've already invested into it. And then that's known as the sunken cost fallacy, because a lot of the time, we are blinded by have the flaws of what we're making and we don't think to pivot and we just like dive right like deep into it, spend many years on something um, because of this very thing. So but the first game I made, it's called Monster Kitchen. And I do believe I I was victim to this second book plus fallacy as well. And that's why it's very it's very close to my heart because um, I worked on it for five, maybe six months um, and I like didn't learn anything from it. Probably like 40 bucks. I released it free game with ads, right? So, like 40 bucks in six months. I think a lot of people releasing their first game will go through that. And it's, that's why I feel so strongly about this topic. And I want to tell people my experiences. Hopefully, they can avoid I'm going through the same thing. Um, but it's not only me. You hear stories about um, pivoting all over the industry, right? You have um, Blizzard with Project Tycoon, which they cut up for like five years and eventually became. You have Supercell. So this picture here um, is a picture from an article that I think Supercell wrote. Um, or at least it's from the website, um, the story. I, again, I'll link it. Um, but basically, Supercell talked about their story about how they would constantly kill, they would kill like 20 games before they come to like this, their great successes. So Supercell made games like Clash of Clans, uh, Clash Royale, Boom Beach. Um, but they were really open about talking of all the games that they killed off to get to the ones that they did eventually release and was successful around. So pivoting is, is just a natural thing in the industry, in the game industry. Um, so a short development cycle will allow you to take a moment to ask yourself, is this still worth it working on this game? And it's not about inserting self-doubt into yourself, but rather it's about asking these hard questions and answering them so that you know the answers to these questions and you are even more determined and you know exactly why you're working on this game if you continue to work on it. So these are just some reasons why um, short development cycles, buttons, you see, and then tiny games are so important to us and why we decide to work in this way. So I'm going to go through some of the methods that work for us. For us. Uh, so the first, first thing I want to talk about is Scrum. This is something we practice right from the beginning. So it has helped us immensely. Um, Scrum, just, I'll try to encapsulate it in a sentence, but this is taken straight from the Scrum Guide online. So it's like an official guide. It's the Bible, it's the source of truth for Scrum. Scrum is the framework for de developing, delivering, and sustaining complex products. How I like to think of it is just a process for a team, a group of people to work together on like, a product that will always change. Right? So this team needs to be constantly adapting. And that, that fits um, games pretty well. <laughs> so, for anyone who's familiar with Scrum, I gotta apologize in advance. I am gonna go through the Scrum events, all the different meetings, just to share why they work for us um, and what they are for. You know, in case anyone of you wanna walk away from 
this to try out any other means. Because they will they will affect the folks. So let's start by imagining a work week, right? We're Monday to Friday, right? So the first meeting I want to share with you guys is called no, that's wrong. The first concept I want to share with you guys is the sprint. So just think of the sprint as um, a period of time where you're gonna do a piece of work, right? And according to Scrum, it can be anywhere between one week to a month. Okay, so this is for this example, we'll go for a week. This is our sprint, Monday to Friday. So the first meeting, the first event is called the Sprint Pack. Um, as you can kind of get from the name, the team's gonna to get together and talk about what do we want to achieve for this week. Okay. So something that we found that we had to do at the studio for sprint planning is that often we made these small games that would be done in two weeks. So we have to come up with ideas for a new game. So we we'll often find ourselves doing some ideation before we actually do the sprint planning. So we'll come together and talk about some new ideas. People will pitch their idea, we'll start voting and everything. And then when we choose the final idea, we'll go into the sprint planning and decide like, what do we want to achieve for the sprint? What's our goal? So we'll set a goal and we'll figure out how we're going to achieve that goal throughout the next few days. Okay, so that's from the second plan, uh, sorry, the second meeting is called the Daily Scrum. And some of you might be familiar with this, uh, I'll know it as a stand-up. Um, so every day, typically in the morning, you the team will meet for 15 minutes to just talk about three things. Um, what you did yesterday, what you're doing today, and what kind of didn't go so well, what do you need help with, right? Now the point of this is to really facilitate communication between the team. Not only do you get to know or get to be on the same page for the progress of the project, right? You know what everyone's working on, but you also get to know some of their problems because often maybe your teammate has a solution to your problem and can solve it in five minutes when you would have taken an hour. So this communication is to try to facilitate that, that teamwork to solve problems uh, together. Okay, the, second, the next meeting we'll talk about is sprint review. So we're done with the week, we've done our work. We have our prototype or game, whatever it is you're working on. So Friday, we'll review it. Usually again at the end of the day. So for sprint review, you go back to the goal that you set for yourself um, in sprint planning. And very simply just ask yourself, did we achieve this goal? And during this time, it, it's, it should be a black and white yes or no answer. And whatever the outcome, it's okay. But you, you're going to learn from it. So that's a good outcome no matter what. But whatever the outcome, you will decide what to do next after the sprint review. Right? Do we want to continue to go from the sprint? Do we want to do a different product? Maybe, maybe that's a huge glaring mistake with this idea after making it for a week and it's time to pivot. Right? So, last meeting, and it's usually after, right after the sprint review, we do a sprint retro. And the sprint retro really goes back to the point of learning that I was talking about. So, this is remote from the game, and you're talking about yourself as an individual or your relationship with the team and how your team works together. Perhaps one teammate is working off-site and there were some issues with hey, <laughs> and there were some issues with like file transfers or just some really mundane process thing, right? Um, this is the time to yeah, this is the time to improve on it. Um, learn from what went wrong and just become better or, or a better for the machine going on to the next sprint. So that's strong and these are some of the meetings that we found really work for us. Um, there is a huge comprehensive Scrum guide online. Not that big actually. 16 pages is worth a read if you're interested in Scrum. Um, again, I have a link to the resources, everything I talked about for this talk that I will share at the end of in the last slide. So um, you guys can check it out there. See. So the next step that I want to share is a design template. So um, anyone in the room who have done any design work before. Um, we'll probably have some sort of template in your mind, like some necessary questions or cues they want to they need to fill in to understand um, an idea. So this is one of the components of our design template. Uh, we call it the visual journey, but it's really just a storyboard for your game. So the screens that your game will have, um, the flow screens. Now, something that we find really useful with the design template when we need to work with as a team is one communication. So this helps us immensely in communicating our idea, right? You have something in your mind, it's, it's awesome, it's great. Um, and we try to tell it to someone, it never seems to get across. So this is something we use to help us get our ideas across and communicate between the team. Now the second thing that the design team helps us do is just increase the quality of our ideas. So this is a current, um, the, the few 
use our current design template that we have uh, developed as we went, and also put some references from our uh, sources uh, um, in, like online. But uh, it helps increase the quality because it lays out the really obvious, not obvious, the really necessary um, parts of a game that we might sometimes overlook when we get really excited about the game here, right? So, um, call things like, uh, I really like the point of magic moments. Um, so magic moments would be a moment in your game where you, you push in a lot of feedback in the game, right? There's a lot of sound, there's a lot of visuals. The example I put here is crossing a line in Mario Kart. So when you play Mario Kart, the latest one, they probably go for the older ones, but I'm not sure the exact feedback they have. On the latest one, when you cross the finish line, the car actually jumps up and does like a 360 turn, and the camera starts panning, and it's like, whoa, that was cool. So those are the magic moments in your game. And um, so filling out this template helps us just increase the quality of the game and helps us maybe think of things that we might not have thought of when we first came up with the idea, right? So make sure you have all these things too. Make sure the game quality is good. Now I have to mention this video. Um, game design like a pro by Ask Game Dev. So again, I have a link to the video um, in the resources page, but uh, these guys do a really good explanation um, of design templates. So this was a quick video talks about the template, and we borrowed some of our views from, from them as well. Um, so I have to give them a shout out. But that's design template for us. Oh, I do want to tell one more story about how we use the design template. So um, story about there is actually, actually from one of our games is called Stumped. Um, and one of the things that were really useful in the beginning of the project to communicate the idea or the, the feeling of stuff to my teammates was um, again, imagine moments in this design template. So the inspiration from Stump came from a children's book. Uh, it's called The Snowman, and if you guys are not familiar with it, it's about a magical snowman who sort of flies into the night and like shows the kid this beautiful city, like this, this kid flying with the snowman, <laughs> and and then like it's a magical night, and then the kid goes to sleep. And then the next day it's bright and the sun's out and the kid's super excited to see the snowman again. He runs out and finds the snowman all melted and just gone, right? So that was imaginable to me like, from that book. And that's something I want to capture in the game. So um, the template helped us help me um, communicate that because I had this really strong magic moment that I wanted to capture that I can just tell guys this is the thing. Um, so yeah, that's how we use the design. Now, the last step that I want to share with you guys is something that we call the project baseline. Now, what is the project baseline? Really, it's just a set of figures or numbers to determine if you're on track to complete your project. Okay, so I'm going to go into like a step by step example, um, but just to give you guys a. Um, just to let you guys know what to expect, we're going to go through four questions. So, that you're going to ask yourself four questions to come up with these figures and to tell you if you're on track. So the first question, oh well, first we're going to have a to-do list, a project to use. <laughs> this is um, supposed to be Mario level 1, so just imagine that. Imagine you're prototyping Mario, you're prototyping the first level, and you decide that this is all the stuff you need to do. I didn't include the first, so maybe not the first level. Part of the first level, right? And you do the cross sprite, the plumber running, and everything. So the first question you ask yourself, what is my current scope, budget, and schedule? Okay, so what is my current scope? How do you measure that? Second, first, you're going to have a list of things to do. Okay, so this screenshot here is from Trello. It's a free task management software um, that you can just look up if you want to use it. Okay, so now we've separated our tasks for our partial Mario level 1 prototype. And if you see on top of each task, there's actually a tag SML and XL with a number. So this, this is simply just Asking yourself how long you think this task will take and is assigning a number to it. The larger the number, the longer you think it will take. So, for example, the grass sprites, maybe I'm going to do it with parts like this one. So, this is the grass sprite for 55 minutes. Um, as opposed to the common Mario jumping, it's like that's going to be like, perfect, right? That's going to be the perfect thing. It's going to take a while. It's five minutes. Okay? So, first question what is my current scope? You, you size anything, you give it a number, and you just add it up. So on the top it says 13, that's my current scope in terms of this number. Um, you're also going to ask yourself budget your schedule. So for the sake of this example, 
I said go in two weeks. I right? have two weeks to make this prototype. Okay, so the second question is, but how much have I learned through the baseline scope? So using this metaphor, let's not sorry, using this example, let's go one week into the future, right? One week has passed, we've done these two things. We've done the grass sprite and the common right. Cool. Um, because we sized them before, we know how many points they are. We have done three points worth of work in this first week. Okay? So the burn, how much have I burned through the baseline scope? Currently, my burn is three in one week. Now the next question remain very simply from your original project, what do you have left? I just removed I removed the grass sprite and the thunder run, and I will this them. And just add up the points again, it's ten points worth of work. That's our remaining scope. Okay, now you guys can probably imagine what's the last question. Tracking based on my burn and my am I on track to learn my remaining baseline, the remaining scope. Um, in this case, no, not really. I took a week to do three points of work and I have ten points left, but only a week left, right? So what do you do? What can you do? Um, there's really only three things you can adjust, um, just like at the beginning. Um, you can adjust the scope, do less things. Maybe maybe this level doesn't need any clouds, right? I'm gonna take it away. Um, it's doing too much though. But what else can you do? You can adjust the budget. Maybe I can put a bit more money into this prototype. Hire an artist perhaps to help me out with the sprites. Lastly, you can change the schedule. If you don't have a tight schedule, you have three weeks to spare, because uh, it's gonna take at least three more weeks to finish that, then sure, go ahead, you're on track to finishing if you give yourself three more weeks. Okay? So I just shared with you guys a really quick example, but I'll go over everything uh, one more time. So the first question, baseline. What is my current scope, budget, and schedule? Uh, remember, you have to size these cards to get, get these useful numbers at the end and tell if you're on track to finishing or not. But, so maybe you're a week, a month into the project, uh, you've already done some work. That's going to give you some vital information about the rate at which you're working, then you can use later on to find out if you're working on time. Remaining, uh, simply your baseline minus your burn, what you have left to do to finish this project. And just do some simple math, and you ask yourself, am I on track to finishing this, um, this scope? Yeah. So I'm gonna I'm gonna have four questions and resources if you guys want to refer back to them again. But that's how you guys can use it for your project. So, oh wait, like, what's what's the deal? Uh, what are some pitfalls and challenges around this way of working? Um, first of all, something that we struggle with the most. Um, in, in the past one and a half years of trying to work this way, of learning how to work this way, was iterating versus pivoting. So one of my points earlier about the strength of um, working with short development cycles was the ability to pivot. All these are chance, all the time to ask us like, to pivot. Something that we really struggled with was we didn't have any metric to tell us when we should iterate versus pivot. We were just so focused on um, developing and pushing with all this metric but it could be anything. It could be like, if this game got 100 downloads, if I got this certain kind of feedback, if the, if the whole mechanic felt a certain way, maybe I'll continue working on it. But if it doesn't, then what are you going to do? You, you should pivot by then. So before you even test your game, your whatever you did in the short this cycle, you need to have this metric uh, to tell you whether to continue or not. It's, it's really hard to to figure it out, but so I, we haven't figured it out yet. <laughs> We're still trying to get better at it. So, but I just want to let you guys know um, something that we found really hard today. Yeah, at least you're aware of uh, some of the challenges. The next thing that we struggled with was um, we were super gung ho about uh, development. We're like, we're gonna do this quickly. We're gonna release a lot of games. It's gonna be something a certain quality that we'll be happy with, and we are. But that didn't leave us a lot of time for anything else. And I'm sure if the if new developers in the room, you would know the importance of everything that's not relevant, right? Marketing, upskilling yourself, doing market research to understand what kind of market you're getting into. And we didn't really leave a lot of time for all that stuff for ourselves, right? So we did a lot of games, we released them, we're proud of them, but we didn't do much marketing. We just like put on Twitter a little bit, which is not much at all. We didn't do much market research. There were a lot of gaps in our knowledge around the market. 
Um, up until like as early as a couple months ago, that we're still learning today. Uh, so, and we didn't leave ourselves time to upskill, like learn some new technology, um, learn other skills, right? So, if you guys want to try working this way, that's fantastic. Maybe try it for two weeks in a month, and then make sure you make time for yourself, maybe a week for learning more about the market, a week for marketing what you just made, right? Don't, don't just keep making games because all the other things around it is super important to you. If, if you want to make a business from if you just want to make games as fun, then sure, like so. That's also how I would love to do that. <laughs> and that brings me towards the end. So I'm just going to summarize everything. First, we went through the why. Um, why tiny games? Why short learning cycles? Why we felt like it was so important, right? Um, next, uh, we, I shared some tools for your toolbox that you can use. That's Scrum, uh, the design template, and this concept of project based I can tell you if you want to crack the finishing. And then lastly, I shared some of the challenges and pitfalls that we fell into or we faced in the last year and a half, um, kind of worked this way. So, I guess the, the last thing I want to leave for you guys, the last message I want to say is that really all this, like, the core of it, uh, what it all really comes down to is learning, right? You create small games, you create a lot of them, <coughs> or you have a lot of short cycles, it's all about just learning faster, right? Learning so you can keep making better games. That's, that's, that's the thing, that's what it all comes down to. Okay? Like, there's so many more things you can do with games, I really believe, that's why I'm so, so excited about working in this industry, but we just need to get there faster. So I, I believe, and I know there are a lot of developers in the room as well, like, we love making games, and there's so much more to do, you just need to learn and get there. 